My name is Carlton Cartwright. I am the executive director for Veterans Memorial and Multicultural Histories Incorporated. Okay, and I'm here today with several of my students, plus um, one of my co-teachers, uh, Keegan, Calviana, Andre, and Felix, and Ms. Campbell. Beautiful. And sir, what is your name? J.R. Thicklin. Okay, Dr. Thicklin, we're here today at Riviera Beach Preparatory Achievement Academy, and uh, today is February 7th. 7th, 2023. And how are you today? I'm doing wonderful. Good, good, good. Um, were you born here in Florida? No, I wasn't. Okay, where were, you, where were you born? I was born in Selma, Alabama. Okay. All right, and how long have you lived here in, in South Florida? Uh, 41 years come August 3rd. Okay. You don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your background? Sure. Good. <laughs> so, um, you grew up in Alabama? I grew up in Alabama. Okay, and what year did you come to Florida? 1982. Okay, and um, when you, by the time you got here, were you done with your education, your professional education? No, I was just beginning it, actually. Okay, so where did, where did, had you started it in Alabama? No, you... I did. I had left Alabama right after high school. Actually, uh, I was on my way to Livingston University, which is now University of West Alabama, on scholarship. And I actually came here to Florida to give my sister away in, in, in the place of my dad for a wedding. And I really got heavily involved with the a spiritual part of my journey and I end up changing all my plans to relocate here back in Florida and as a result of that everything went a different direction uh, end up at Palm Beach Junior College at that time from Palm Beach Junior College to South uh, South College that, that became South University and then went back to uh, really my field in religious studies there at uh, Southeastern Theological Seminary, and then from there did some studies with University of Phoenix, certification programs, and then ultimately to uh, Logos University in Jacksonville. Oh. Well, I've spent over 30 uh, years specifically addressing the issues of domestic and sexual violence, uh, uh, the plight of fatherhood. I've done so as executive director and founder of a nonprofit, Destiny by Choice. Uh, and uh, we've done everything from educate, empower, from middle schools, high schools, to universities, to corporations. Uh, and we have, we have built our whole circle around the family. Uh, and the reason being that is that uh, there's an old uh, adverb, uh, should I say an old proverb, that actually says that the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. And so out of that, we can find every social ill, we can find every situation there. So we've had a number of programs that we've either written or we have administered over the years through our nonprofit work and some of our for-profit work, including uh, Destiny Changers, Building Boys to Men. Uh, that program there basically was a program that addressed young men from the ages of 11 all the way up to 18. And it was meant to build self-image. It was meant for them to understand uh, themselves to recognize uh, things such as fi to learn financial literacy, to learn how to deal with emotions, kind of redefining what does masculinity look like, what does uh, femininity look like. And as a result of it, that program there, it was based on the uh, quote from Frederick Douglass that it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. And at any given sector of time, I would be in schools in that day or in the morning and I will be out at prisons such as uh, Everglades Correctional Reentry Facility in Miami where I taught men in a program called Safe Return, preparing them to reenter back into society. We do the same things in prisons such as uh, Single Palm Reentry. Uh, along with that, in a course of a day, I got a chance to see children and I got a chance to see broken men. And so that was the fulfillment of my life. How do I prevent these children from becoming these men that I'm dealing with behind bars. How do I help these men behind bars rebuild their life? Because Frederick Douglass did not say it was impossible. He just simply said it's easier to build strong children than it is to repair broken men. So all of that have played right into the whole context of my life purpose, uh, dealing with that. Spent 13 years uh, dealing with, uh, if you would, increasing knowledge as far as uh, 
black infant mortality? How do we deal with that, the disparities that happen when uh, black babies are dying at an alarming rate, five, literally three times the proportion of other babies? So all of these things, as you notice, all evolve around the family. So inside of my work, I've done numerous of things. I've worked with the, uh, I've done a lot of research work in which we've been published inside of it uh, with our work with the University of Minnesota School of Social Work, the Institute on Domestic Violence in African American Community, where we specifically, with a team of us, we co-wrote a curriculum called Speaking of Faith, Domestic Violence Program in the African American Church, where we took on the issue of the role of the church in addressing domestic violence and what role should we take. Uh, we. Since that time, we developed here with the uh, with the Palm Beach County uh, uh, Palm Beach County Sexual Assault Response Team, which is part of Victim Services. We uh, we wrote and we put together a whole piece called uh, the Clergy Toolkit on Domestic and Sexual Violence. And so, in the aspect of what we've done is to actually find ourselves helping to build communities and families. Coming into the schools is where it all began for me inside of doing this work, inside of reaching out to young people. Uh, many years ago, dating and domestic violence, uh, reaching out to them as far as character building, uh, reaching out to them as far as them just self-discovery of who they are. And I find it to still be the same thing. Uh, you know, whether we're researching, whether we're developing things for universities or for different states, uh, I consider what I've done unique in this sense here. Although I've spent over 30 years in addressing domestic violence, I spent the first 14, maybe the first 17 years of it, uh, specifically addressing the uh, side of the victim and what happens with the victim. But uh, since that time, I've uh, done extensive work in addressing the role of the batterer, the perpetrator. How do that person reach wholeness? How do that person be restored? So the combination of doing that type of work along with podcasts and things that we've done over the years have uh, have opened up a lot of significant doors and we like to say that we've kind of changed the narrative in the movement because of the fact that we recognize all things don't remain the same. With research, with knowledge, when we know better, we do better and as a result of it we can change uh, we can change systems and that has been uh, the bulk of the work. Go ahead. It's a very interesting thing when we say black on black crime that term have been coined and we say there's so much black on black crime but the reality is the same proportion. There's more white on white crime than it is white on black crime or black on white crime. What we see is this. Unfortunately, in our sad history, we have benefited from this thing that we use as racism to divide and to subjugate people and put them in different classes. So to, to lift up and say black on black crime is so terrible, it only continues with the narrative of saying that black is less than. You're unable to be civilized. You're, una you're unable to function. You're unable to get along. So we lift those things up. And I believe that if you told something long enough, if you told it often enough, if that's what you believe, it becomes a recorder in your mind. So your sense of value of who you are is oftentimes shaped by what you've been told. And this is another reason why having accurate history, having accurate information, having accurate things that we need to know to appreciate. I appreciate my heritage coming from Selma, Alabama. I appreciate knowing that I was born and raised in a city that literally was the, was the center of the civil rights movement, though I was a lad. My city, because of what happened from there to Montgomery, was the city that eventually launched the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And so I take great pride in that, but had I not known my history, had I not known my significance, the people who raised me or the people that we read about in history books, I might not have the same drive and the same determination. So in, in essence, what I'm simply saying is this, is that we have to change the narrative. But in order to change the narrative, we have to understand what the story was in the first place. And so when we use terms like black on black crime and we buy into it, it's, just, it's more of a self-hatred. And we've been taught to self-hate ourselves. We don't like our nose, we change it. We don't like this, we change it. We don't like things about ourselves. When I grew up, there was a song that was out that was called Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. And for that reason, I was able to walk and hold my head up and it did not bother me what people thought of me because I was proud of that. 
That is called a sense of pride that is based upon your assurance within yourself. Not an intimidating pride where others actually find themselves, in order to be on top, they feel like they have to push other folks down to the bottom. So we have to change that story. We have to change that philosophy. As far as racial profiling, racial profiling happened because, once again, it's a part of that continuing narrative. The continuing narrative is, who are we looking for? The problem is we've been racial profiled so much that we start, we start gravitating, becoming exactly what the profiling is all about. Whether it's an act of resistance, whether it's an act of defiance, there is no victory in that until we have lifted ourselves up from the obscurity, from the mindsets that continue to say that we're less than. See, the only way that we move as a people is that we have to understand ourselves as people, have a pride in who we are, understanding that lifting my brother and my sister is the only way that I can really say that I've contributed to the world. And that's what it's all about. We have to reverse. We have to reverse really America inside of our thinking. We have to reverse it. Unfortunately, America has taken a lot from a lot of folks. But the way that I've known to have succeeded in life is that when we become givers and not takers, I think that we have a ways to go. And the reason that we have a ways to go is because of what you said earlier, that when we only used to attribute the word trauma, particularly PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, to people who have served in the military, that meant that, that we pigeonholed the effect and what trauma really was. When the reality is that trauma happens every day in our life, any type of uh, incident or any type of event that happened in our life that is, that is not only out of the ordinary but is overwhelming, it basically overloads our circuits, our ability to process. And so on one end, we've been told just deal with it, we go on, we soak it up, we learn to be resilient, all these great words. But the reality is that we have to process. In order to process, that means that, first of all, we have to acknowledge that it's there. So what has happened, both good and bad, is that in the, in, in, in the aftermath of COVID-19, we now have a place to point to. It becomes our starting point, our catalyst, although it's always existed. We had mass shootings and mass uh, things like that happened before COVID-19. But all of a sudden now you hear a greater crowd for mental health. We need mental health. People are traumatized. Mental health. Well, we've needed mental health for many years. But the stigmatization to mental health, the stigmatization to trauma, all of those things kept people from the table. So when we use words like they're crazy, they're off, people laugh at it. But the reality is that everyone is tested by trauma. Everyone deals with trauma. So where America is now, in my opinion, we have gotten probably, if I was to give us a score, we're right about tittling around about 63 to 65 in terms of the way that we've dealt with it. Because what it's going to call for is what we're seeing. More, more not only research, but more money being poured into mental health services. Understanding that people are broken, but the word broken doesn't always mean inoperable. It simply means that it's an opportunity to be repaired. And so when we look at what is it that we do to repair people, how do people heal? That's where we start talking about trauma therapy. That's when we start talking about how do we intervene? How do we deal with the trauma of abandonment? How we do to deal with the trauma of loss? How do we deal with the trauma of grief? All of those things are there and we have dealt with every day of our lives. It's just now that we are naming it. Violence, we've had. What happened during the pandemic is this. We were so isolated. You remember, we told everybody to stay home. Everybody stay home. Well, in my field, that means that we told the victim to stay home with the batterer. That meant that when we say safe at home, they were never safe at home. Matter of fact, we saw it not only with victims and batterers in the normal term. We saw it with our school-aged children. Parents was writing, please open the schools, get these kids, because all of a sudden parents could not stand their own kids all day long. Traumatic experience. Gotcha. Child abuse went up during that time. Why? Trauma, our ability to resolve, be resilient, deal with things. And so as a result, it put America to a place that we hit a bubble at, at, at the right time and yet the wrong time. Incidents that caused that birth things like the Black Lives Matter movement, it was that America was so at home that now, it was the first time we've caught incidents happen on camera. Incidents been caught on video forever. 
but it was the right moment in America's history while the world was standing still in the midst of a pandemic that we didn't know what we were going to do. And when we was isolated and scared and all of a sudden our humanity was at question. And when we watched a man being literally choked to death, knee on them, I can't breathe and die in front of us, it awakened something what I call the human spirit that had nothing to do with race, but it was the human spirit and soul that said, this ain't right. This can't be happening. It's not the first time we've seen that human spirit. We saw that human spirit right there in Selma, Alabama, the base of that bridge. When Bloody Sunday happened, that was an all-out cry. It was the first time America had seen on TV, on video, this type of atrocity happen. And people loaded up from everywhere, black, white, Jews, and everywhere. And they came to a little place called Selma, Alabama because of their human spirit said, that isn't right. I think there's two answers that are correct at the same time. Uh -huh. I think that there's not enough in the sense that we need a lot. We got a lot of catching up to do. Then again, I think that there's too little incorporation of what we do have. And what do I mean? When we start talking about mental health, mental health is on so many different levels. There are things, it, 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 I liken it to going to the hospital, going to the ER, even a trauma center. When you get there, there's a triage nurse who assesses you. They find out the basic things, the information. And from there, they know whether or not to send you left or right or to what specialist. I think the gatekeepers, the entries in our society ought to be willing, ought to be trained. I think we have to. I myself, a uh, mental health first aid trainer. Uh, I myself, mental health first aid specialist. And my whole goal is to train entities, whether churches, why we say churches, well, especially in some community, that's an entrance door. That's, where the, that's access and entry to families. And so I'm seeing families. That means that I might see families at a point where they're not at work. They're just in a setting where they might be expected to be you know, cool, calm, worship, and just interacting. But if we're able to recognize just certain signs of mental health, issues. They don't have to always be this se severe. You know, uh, it, they don't have to be the, the, the severe disorders. They could be just the small ones. If we know how to address those things, like a good triage nurse, we then can refer them on. Building those type connections that happens with a network of social service workers, counselors, therapists, psychologists. In other words, there's so much room. Part of it is the educating of people to understand what they don't know. So that's a phrase we love using. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to not admit that you're not okay. It's okay to not be okay because when we take a condition and we make it shame, and that's what happens, stigmatism happens because we shame-based people. We make them feel terrible, like they're so different because things happen. Well, how do we classify that? We have to be willing to pour more. And I don't want to say it's about dumping monies, but it's about building relationships. It's about building those things, understanding that we're interdependent upon one another. Unfortunately, I'll say this, the only other place other than church is school <laughs> because school is the, only, is the other entity where people gather in large numbers. So we have to begin to flood the system with, if you would, with the right mental health counselors and the right backgrounds in the school. And don't put all that weight on just the teaching staff alone. I think that our system is perplexed and our system is actually bound by a political division. It is what two different sides vision of what it looks to be reform, to be rehabilitated, to be renewed. In one sense, no, there's not enough. We need to pour more into reentry on every one of those levels there. You cannot take a person out of society, yes, rightfully so. We used to call it the correctional system because it was meant to be a place of correction, not a place of warehousing. If we warehouse you and you never are prepared to re-enter, you are more likely to repeat what you've done. So we have to be able to provide services inside, provide services outside. If you've paid your debt to society, why are we playing political game? Well, now that you've paid your debt, you know, you got another debt now. You got to pay off it. You can't vote. You can't do these things. You can't get a job. Well, that's like double indemnity. I paid my debt, but now you're going to punish me again. We have to have the right programs of reentry on every level. With juvenile, it starts early. We used to use the word diversion. Remember diversionary program, diversion. I think we have to begin to wrap around both restorative justice with reentry. 
and that is from A to Z. The second chance model, the model in which an individual understands now that I want to be a contributing member of society and not take away from society. And I think that's going to happen when we can stop tripping over one another with our political divides and begin to look once again through the eye of human, of the human spirit.